the Thelma curve, um, which is kind of, I was never a really good pitcher, but I'm pretty good at messing with them. Um, that song, as they were, as they were uh, singing it, and it just kind of hit me with that and what, what Glenn was saying. And uh, even Steve's prayer earlier, um, conversations I've had over this last week with, with different people, last two weeks with different people, um, situations that are happening now, just um, that I read about on Facebook with families losing family members, tragically, and, and all this type of thing, and even some of the responses I've had on the uh, questionnaires this month, that uh, there is always someone in this room who needs the opportunity to um, just go to God pray to get something taken care of, whether it was just a, a situation that happened this week, or whether it's things that they've been struggling with for years. Um, a lot of times when we do these types of um, response times, it's after the sermon. Um, and I don't know, honestly, I, I don't know why it needs to be right now, but it does. If you were part of our prayer team, I would ask you that you'd come up and, and sit on the, uh, on the front rows um, just to be ready. Um, Marvin, if you would too, since you've said you want to be part of the, the prayer team, I want you to come on up. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know who's going to respond. But I've asked the, well, you saw me. I just asked the band to, to sing. What, and you can just, whatever you want, you feel, feel makes sense best sense what Glenn said is the uh, my goal at, this, at the church it's not just my goal it's the goal and, and, and please understand anytime I say my goal um, when, I, when I'm saying that it's, it's the the entire leadership Team that I'm talking about everybody who who has who prays over this church. It is their desire too. I uh, there are people here who need need to need help this morning. I don't know what it is. I don't know what what your situation is. I don't know if it's because you came here and and uh, you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ and you just need to do it this morning. Um, I was telling, um, I was talking to some youth kids last week when we were trying to decide what to do with them, and, and Jim Phillips was in there, and I told him that um, there's no greater joy that I have than to pray with somebody who's decided that they want to place their faith in Jesus Christ and have Him be the Lord of their life. I have tried a lot of other ways to get that same feeling. And I will tell you, there's not a substance on this planet that gives you the kind of feeling that praying with someone to help them connect to the God who created them and loved them enough to die for them. So this morning, if you're here and you've never done that, I would ask you to take care of that this morning. There, and, and I realize coming forward is tough. Uh, when I was growing up, um, the, the preachers would say the first step was the toughest. And honestly, in my own, own life, I experienced that. The first step was tough, and then I pretty much ran the rest of the way. If you don't want to come forward this morning, there, the requirement is not that you come forward in a church the requirement is not that you you kneel somewhere and have someone who is an official representative of a fellowship of faith pray with you so they can give you your Christian card. If you're in your seats this morning, you can come to Jesus just as easily as if you're up here. 
I would ask you one thing, if you're doing that, if maybe you just have questions, you don't know, you can raise your hand. No one else is really going to be paying attention, hopefully. And then somebody from our prayer team, or I, or someone else who knows Jesus, and there are quite a few people in this room who know Jesus, will come with you, and they'll talk to you, and they'll pray with you. I don't want someone to, I don't want you to decide to follow Jesus out of an emotional response. I want you to do it because you realize it's what you need. I don't want you to do it in ignorance. And so if you need that extra help this morning, feel free to raise your hand. This, I will, I will tell you this, and, and I'm always honest with you, but in, 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 I've been in thousands of churches, and that is not an exaggeration. And I've never been in a church that is more open to people having spiritual issues and going to Jesus to see to see those things fixed. I've never been in a church that was more accepting and less judgmental when you raise your hand and say, I need help. I'm not saying there are churches as open to that. I'm just saying I've never been in one that's more. So this morning, regardless of your of your issues, and I realize I've done this before, and and we can get people you know, can get bogged down by the fact that if we we've done this and people don't respond or their the lines aren't line you know the altars aren't lined and all that kind of garbage that's really a human definition of what's happening. But this morning, whether it's something massive or whether it's something small, I want to encourage you this morning. You can come up here. You can pray here. We've had people praying on the steps before. You can sit in your, in your seat and you can pray. You can go into the back corner where we have designated that we are going, we're in the process of coming up with a plan for a prayer, uh, a prayer room. Whatever you need to take care of it tonight, today, you can do it today. We're talking a lot about plans and, and execution and assessments and all that kind of stuff, and it's important stuff. I know there are a lot of people who plan to make changes in their lives. It's January, right? That's what we do in January. We join gyms. We start reading. Pro, uh, we start Bible reading um, plans. We uh, start doing different things with our kids. We eat better. It's January. That's what we're supposed to do. But plans without execution are worthless. There's stacks and stacks. I, I can show you all the different eating plans I've had. All the exercise programs I've started or planned to start. And obviously, they've not done me a whole lot of good because I haven't executed them. A plan without execution is worthless. And so if you've planned to take care of business with God, if you've planned to make changes, start the execution this morning. Start the process this morning, whether it's coming up here, whether it's in your, in your chair, whether it's here, whether it's in the lobby, whether, whether you're by yourself or you're asking someone else to pray with you. There are massive hurts. There are minor hurts. There are questions people have. Let's start the process this morning as they're singing. They're not going to sing for very long. He's going to do a, 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 huh? a verse, a couple choruses. People start responding. He may go a little bit longer. But we're going to let God do business this morning. I've got things to say, but I always have things to say. This morning, I think God's got more important things to say to a lot of people in this room. Let me pray with you as, as their Father, um, I, don't, I don't know why you're wanting, wanting me to do this. This is out of the ordinary, um, but that's fine. I, I'm cool with that. I had to be when I, when I accepted your call to ministry. Pray that you'll speak this morning. That you'll move this morning. And that
that we will move as a result. Thank you, Lord, for your for your presence. We thank you for your plan of salvation. You know, when you when you created a plan of salvation, you executed it to the fullest extent. Your plan started in Genesis and it continued through the Old Testament and the New Testament came here as a child, as a baby, grew up, taught us how to live, died, and rose again, Lord, and we can trust you. The plan, your end of the plan has been performed. Luckily for us, our only only option, the only part that we have to do is it's to accept it. And I pray that we will do that this morning. I pray that we will get by beyond all the pain and all the hurt all the emotional stuff, all the different things that have been happening. And uh, that we will just go to you, whether it's up here, whether it's back there, wherever it is, God. I pray that when the, when the time comes, we make those changes. When you show up the way you say you're going to show up, and you always have in so many lives throughout, these, throughout history, Lord, that we will give you the glory. We will testify to your power and your grace. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Go ahead and stand with me.
Thank you. Uh, got gum. Sorry, I didn't. I got my mother would yell at me if I chewed with my gum when I spoke. I just realized it. Um, <laughs> those bugs, they will not die. Was, thank you for um, being patient. Thank you for. Um, being willing to kind of adjust as we go through there. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate the fact that God can move and we can move with him and not, not be stuck. I appreciate that you guys just said amen. That was great. That You guys can keep doing that. Um, one of the things I wanted to um, encourage those of you who are, are there, I, I, just, I don't know what happened. I don't know anything that, that really went on as far as the prayer time goes, but I would ask you, um, if something happened, if you made some kind of progress this morning, if you really made a connection with God and were able to, to, to get some things taken care of, I want you just to share it with somebody. You don't have to tell me, although I would be thrilled if you would tell me. You don't have to tell somebody, you don't have to go out and, and yell it from the rooftops, although that could be kind of cool. Um, but tell somebody, somebody with whom you can celebrate because what we don't realize sometimes is the greatest type of evangelism the greatest act of evangelism is just for us to share what God is doing in our own lives we uh, we get bogged down we think that has, we have to know theology we have to know um, the Roman road or one of those other things but I'll tell you the way that you connect to the people with whom you come into contact the way that, that God becomes real to them it's for them to see that God is real to you. And so I encourage you, if something, if you're, if God is working through you and, and, and working in your life, share it with other people. I love it when I see Facebook things. I, I don't really enjoy Facebook all that much. But I like it when people talk about the blessings that God has given them. One of the people in here, and she would, she'll probably kill me after church because she likes to be 
um, incognito when she's here, um, is, is Katie Lee. She, um, she's right back there behind Amy. Uh, she's not a bashful person. She just, you know, likes to kind of get in. I love it because when she never ceases to praise God when something happens in her life. She puts it on there, and it's, and it's uplifting. And, and, and I, I watch the responses of other people um, when she says stuff like that. I see it in other, in other people when they do that too. I, I, and it's exciting. And it's simple, and it's Facebook, you know, which is, I'm, I'm pretty sure Paul didn't have it. But, um, but it's useful. It can be a tool for good. A small one, but it can be a tool for good. Over the last three weeks, or two weeks, we've discussed this idea of kind of figuring out where we're going to go. Where do we go from here? We've established who we are and what we are and where we are, and where are we headed? That's the question. It's vision month, you know, to a certain extent. And we've talked about assessing where we are, and um, I will, I'm, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to revert to teacher Jamie for just a second. All of you had an assignment the first week of January, and it was to answer the questionnaire. If we were giving grades, half of you would have failed because I got about 40 the first week, and then last week when I made this very long and passionate plea, I got two. Okay? They don't take that long. If you don't know, you're, you're going to know the answers because it's an opinion thing. Okay, and if you don't have an opinion, there are plenty of people in here who will give you theirs. Okay? So, and if you don't know the answers to the questions, because it asks about care team ministry and community team, if you don't know those things, put that on there, because we want to know where we need to communicate better. But the, the questionnaires are back there. They're simple. It will take you three or four minutes to do it. And because they've already done their closing song, I'll probably just dismiss you to go do that for the last five minutes. So maybe you'll actually get it done. Um, We want to know what you think, what you know about the church. We've got plans. We know that what we feel like God has has, has instilled in us and what he wants us to do. But we want to know what you feel God wants you to do. What you think can happen. Where you think Fellowship of Faith can go. It doesn't mean that we're going to take all all your suggestions and make it a massive change. We're not going to be bringing pews in and all that kind of stuff. But I want it, we want to know. If you've been here for a long time and you say, well, I know Jamie. I know the leadership. They know what I think. Do it anyway. Just get it in there. Just put it on there so we can know. Um, we want your feedback. We want to know. It's, and, and guys, if you honestly, if your wives fill out all your paperwork... Um, and you don't usually do that, like I said, it's like six questions. Do it yourself this time. Even if you have a tendency, even the whole time you were through high school, you allowed girls to do your homework for you. Not that I'm speaking to anybody directly. Um, Everybody makes plans. We talked about that already. It's January, we make plans. Um, But plans without execution are worthless. I've I've already discussed that. I'm not going to talk any more about that. But when I was looking through Scripture this week, I really had this idea. I was, I was trying to find these places, these examples of where a plan was very, very well executed. And we talked about God's plan a little bit already uh, of salvation, but there are other places in there, especially in the Old Testament, where God gives very specific plans to people and they execute them, and when they execute them well, amazing things happen. One of my favorite stories, and it's not in your re- weekly reading, but if you, will, if you want to look at it, start in like Exodus 25 and read for about 15 verses or 15 chapters. And what you'll see is God giving a very clear explanation for how he wants his tabernacle to be built. He gives very clear definitions of, how, of dimensions and all of those types of things. And then what he does, what, what's really interesting is he does that for a little while and then he did that, did that, does that for a little while, and then Moses and the people of Israel do it. They fulfill the prophets, and, and, and not only do they fulfill the plan, but they end up providing the materials beyond anything that I think Moses would have ever expected. 
Because what, at the, there's one point where God says you have to have all this gold, you have to have all this silver, you have to have all these things, and Moses opens it up to the Israelites. And this is weird for the Israelites because they're not really known in, in Exodus for being you know, really good at obeying things. But Moses says, bring your stuff in, bring your precious metals in. And at one, at, at, there's a point at which Moses says, you don't have to bring any more. Please stop bringing those precious metals to me because we have what we need to fulfill the plan. And that's one of the greatest, I, I love that story because so often in churches, we get this idea in our brain that um, there is not enough, that we live in this uh, 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 world of scarcity of resources, that, we just, there, that our, our um, little contribution could not possibly make an impact on, on the, the kingdom of God. And I will tell you this, this morning, the reason they did that, there were other reasons, the fact that the Egyptians gave them tons of stuff when they were leaving, but the reason that they had more than what they needed wasn't because they were all extremely wealthy people. The reason they had more than they needed is that because people were willing to give what was necessary to see God's plan executed. And I don't, we're going to talk about money a lot more this year than we usually do because we haven't really talked about it much for about eight years. Um, and it's not going to be in the, in the, the typical way. Um, but I want you to know, whether you're giving, whether your tithe is small, or whether it's massive, God will use it. This week, uh, I was meeting with the care team, and uh, we were talking about the plans and talking about things we already do, the plans that God has, what we feel like God is moving us in the next in the next year, and we talked about the fact that in the future we want. I mean, we have money budgeted there, but there we the goal would be that there be so much more money budgeted there, so we could reach our community in so many different ways through missions work and through other things. And and I, as I talk to the different leaders of the different of the different teams, that's the response I have. And I, here's the thing: I truly believe that we that God is going to give us what we need throughout this next year, to do what we need to do for ministry. But I will also tell you this. You can play a role in that by your willingness to give of your resources, not just money. We're going to talk about gifts in a little bit. But that story in Exodus, and it's a long one. That's the reason we didn't read it this morning. I know you guys probably think I like long passages, but I didn't feel like reading five chapters or ten chapters this morning, um, although sometimes it probably feels like I do. Um, but I encourage you, in Exodus, a lot of people don't like Exodus after they get out of Egypt, okay, especially in this part because there's very, it's very specific. But I want you to look at it because the reason they wrote it the way they wrote it is they wanted to show what God said and what God's people did and what happened as a result of their obedience. It's amazing. It's amazing stuff. Another story in there is Nehemiah. You know, we read a little bit of Nehemiah at the beginning of the year, or beginning of the month, which I guess was at the beginning of the year. Um, and we talked about how Nehemiah came, he came, he realized that the, the walls of Jer Jerusalem were, were destroyed and that they were, uh, that they needed protection. And he came back and, and realized what needed to be done. He realized um, he had the people who were willing to do it. And one of the things we didn't talk about is he, after he had assessed the situation, they rebuilt the walls in 52 days. And so that's an amazing plan. And Nehemiah must have been a planner, but he must have been more than just an administrator because he lit a fire under the tail ends of those people. And in 52 days, even though there were people who were threatening attacks, even though it says in there that they were building with one hand and holding a sword with another, in 52 days they rebuilt the walls of an entire city. My question before we get into, this is not even the real part of the sermon. The question I have is, if that's what God is willing to do with a, few, with a group of exiles who had just gotten home, who had come home, they were li living there in, in the middle, they really didn't have a whole lot. They were pressed about by 
people all around at every turn. God, they were trying to be stopped. And they, they did it in 52 days. What is God's plan for a church in the richest country to ever exist in 2014 in southeastern Ohio? What can God do with us? If we are obedient, if we allow him to allow us to execute his plan. Now, the, my best, my favorite example, there's that word again, my favorite example though, and it was funny because as I was discussing this, as I got this together, uh, Mark Curry was telling me that God had put the exact same um, book of the Bible on his heart this month or this week. One of my favorite examples of this is Ezra. We're going to read some different passages from Ezra this morning to look at this story because I love the stories of the Bible, not because they're fiction, but because they are amazingly real and God moved in amazing ways. And I want to look at these and sometimes we read snippets of different stories, but today we're going to kind of go through the entire story of Ezra and these, these people of Israel. So we're going to start in Ezra 1, four quick verses in Ezra 1. Um, and move on. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the, spirit, by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and also put it in writing, saying, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia. <laughs> that's, that's funny. It's just like Cyrus, king of, king of Persia, said this, and that's the first thing he says is his name. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may as God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Every survivor at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with a freewill offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So that's the, the, the decree, and it's, it's interesting for me, the first thing is that um, the decree to rebuild the temple of Jerusalem came from a non-Jewish king in another part of the world. And he sends Ezra, and the next chapter gives you the whole list of all the different people who went. And we're not going to read chapter 2 today, because it's a, a list of a bunch of names that are very difficult to pronounce. Um, I don't want to actually have to pronounce them all, and you don't want to hear me. So we're not going to do that, but it's interesting to me because there are a couple of things about this plan. First of all, the plan that came to Ezra and the plan that came to the people of Israel was not their plan. One of the interesting things in chapter 1 is it says that as it came from the, first of all, from Jeremiah 70 plus years ago, that this was going to happen. It was time to go home. It was time to rebuild. But it came from a heathen king who had never probably even stepped foot in Jerusalem, that it was time to make some changes. It was time to rebuild the temple. And one of the reasons that that hit me so clearly is because, first of all, I'm the second pastor at this church. In the first 10 years, there was a lot of vision stuff, and I was, I was in on the ground floor of it. I sat with the vision, with the, you know, it used to be called the lead team and, and Pastor Greg and listened as they discussed the plans God had for them. And, got, and had for fellowship of faith. And I listened to them, and, and what you guys, a lot of you don't realize is the same stuff I've been talking about for the last three or four months is the same stuff they talked about at the beginning. Different things happened. There were deviations and all kinds of other things that happened. But the reality is the vision that came here of transforming lives and serving Jesus Christ is not, it did not originate with me. The amazing thing is it didn't originate with them either. It originated with God, and, it, and, and the plan that they had for developing a church, even if it's, you know, modern worship and technology and all those kinds of things, the goal was the same as it was in Acts 2, is to make disciples and to be disciples who make disciples. That's it. It hasn't changed. And so sometimes when we get into the idea of a plan, we start hearing plans and we start talking about execution, some people have a tendency, if it's not their plan, to not get on board with it. 
Uh, they would say it's because they're leaders and that's God has gifted them to lead and because they're leaders, they're supposed to make every other leader in the world um, irritated. Um, I don't see that in the scripture anywhere. Uh, there's nothing in there about that, but I'll tell you this. A lot of times we mistake being a contrarian or a troublemaker for being a leader. It's not the same thing. Sometimes the vision comes from someone else. Sometimes it comes from somewhere else. And sometimes what we are called to do is to be the servants that Christ said we were supposed to do to work to fulfill the vision. Sometimes the vision, the plan comes from somewhere else and we are called to execute it. It's interesting, Cyrus made, told Ezra he had to go do it and Ezra said, you know, that's a really good idea. I wish I had thought of that. And he goes back. He takes them back with him. We have to get, the, we have to get beyond the mentality that the only good idea is our idea. We have to get to the understanding that what needs to happen is for us to act and us to love and us to move forward, period. Whether you like me or whether you like Nancy Blevins, which I don't know why anyone would not like Nancy Blevins, or whether you, you don't like Jen Mills or Steve Sisson, I, I can see that, but um, <laughs> the, uh, or um, grew up with them. It's... But whatever reason, it is your job, it is our job to understand the plan and to execute it. Was he not, he's not even in here for me to crack that joke. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but sometimes it doesn't come from you. It doesn't mean that your part is no more important because you weren't the one who did it. I'm going to read something in, in 1 Corinthians that will um, solidify this for everybody in here. Uh, Ezra 3, okay, so Ezra 2, they all come here. In Ezra 3, um, we've got four verses in Ezra, Ezra 3, starting with verse 7. They gave money to the Masons, not the organization, people who actually lay bricks, carpenters and food, drink and oil to the Sidonians and the Tyrians to bring cedar wood from Lebanon to the Sea at Joppa, according to the permission they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. In the second year of this coming to the house of God at Jerusalem in the second month, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, see those are the kind of two I don't want to read all, all the time, and Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and the rest of their brothers, the priests and the Levites. And all who came from the captivity to Jerusalem began the work and appointed the Levites from 20 years and older to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. Then Jeshua with his sons and brothers stood united with Cadmiel, and his sons, the sons of Judah, and the sons of Hanadad, with their sons and brothers, the Levites, to oversee the workmen in the temple of God. When the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord according to the directions of the King David of Israel. Then sang praise and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good, and his loving kindness is upon Israel forever. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. First steps of execution. First step requires cooperation. It requires us to work together. If that verse 7 said all the people who came to Jerusalem did the work. They all had different work. Some of them were Levites. Okay, the Levites had very specific things they had to do in taking care of the temple and taking care of the utensils of the temple. Okay, they said the sons of Asaph. Asaph, if you read Psalms, there are a lot of the Psalms in there that are attributed to Asaph. The sons of Asaph, those guys who came back and they were the musicians. They were the, the celebration team of Israel. They, did, they had their part. They laid the foundation First steps, first of all, we have to acknowledge that our plan comes from God. It doesn't come from people. We have to believe that our plan comes from God. In order to execute it, we have to cooperate. We have to collaborate. We have to be willing to hold each other up and to do it. And it takes that. It took it then, and you were going to see as, as time progressed and as opposition came up, it took all of the people 
to complete this temple. In this chapter, one of my, um, I remember studying this in seminary, um, in chapter 3 after this, they, they're doing this massive um, celebration. And there are two things that happen simultaneously. The young people are celebrating because God's doing amazing things and they're building their temple again. And the old people are sitting back and lamenting the fact that the other temple was destroyed. And they want things to be back the way they used to be 70 years ago. When Asaph did the music, not his sons. And they're crying about it. And it says they're crying so loudly and that the young people are celebrating so loudly that you could hear it outside of Jerusalem and you couldn't tell who was crying and who was celebrating. I am glad that we have people from all different backgrounds. We have, we have people in this church who are hardcore Baptists Born and raised. Yeah, I know you heard that. You said that one, Marvin. <laughs> Hard, hardcore. That's the way they were raised. And if they might be Southern Baptist or American Baptist or Independent Baptist or Free Will Baptist or uh, one of the other Baptists or Anabaptist or you know something else that they made up today, they could be a Baptist. We have people who, in this background who have Presbyterian backgrounds who grew up Catholic, who grew up, who grew up Methodist. And we're glad for those people. They've got, we've got people who grew up in little country churches where everybody was yelling and spitting at you the whole time. Trust me, I've wiped some of that off my face. My parents used to make me sit in the front row every Sunday. I've been in the four-hour services. We've got those backgrounds. And what, what is amazing to me, what is exciting to me, is that we can see the value in all of those. There are wrong things in all of them. We have all been in some church where someone has hurt us. And God has brought up, for whatever reason, has brought this combination of people together. He's brought us together to collaborate, to cooperate, to see his plan executed for fellowship of faith, regardless of background. If we all raise up the name of Jesus, we all acknowledge the life-changing power of the grace of Jesus Christ, the moniker doesn't matter. Method of worship doesn't matter. What things used to be doesn't matter. Bad mistake, mistakes that I make or that Greg made or that any number of leaders have made or people who have come, people who have left, that is not the important thing. The important thing is that the plan of God to transform lives, serve Jesus Christ, is our collective decision and that we move forward to cooperate and to collaborate in seeing it done. Because that's what it takes. If we go into Ezra 5, now in Ezra 4 what happens is um, people come up and they say, this is not cool. We don't want you building a, your temple. And so they write a letter to, to the king and they say, you realize the other king dies. They, they said, do you realize that these people are troublemakers, that they're going to build this temple, and then they're going to build their wall, and then they're going to come out, and they're going to try to overthrow the, the kingdom. And because of their complaining and their trouble and the fact that they're coming in and trying to destroy what God has planned and has God has put into place, the people are told to stop. And for a while, that happens. But in chapter 5... I was, I was just, I love this part of it. The chapter five and, and is a letter, four and five are letters that were written to the, uh, to the king. But in, in chapter five, verse 11, here's what the letter says. When the people who started working again were confronted by all these troublemakers, it said, thus they answered us saying, we are the servants of God of heaven and earth. 
and are rebuilding the temple that was built many years ago, which a great king of Israel built and finished. But because our fathers had provoked the God of heaven to wrath, he gave him into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed this temple and deported the people to Babylon. However, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Babylon, King Cyrus issued a decree to rebuild this house of God. Also the gold and silver utensils of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple in Jerusalem and brought them to the temple of Babylon. These King Cyrus took from the temple of Babylon and they were given to one whose name was Sheb- Sheshbazar, whom he had appointed governor. He said to him, take these utensils, go and deposit them in the temple in Jerusalem and let the house of God rebuilt, be rebuilt in its place. And that Sheshbazar came and laid the foundation of the house of God in Jerusalem. And from then until now it has been under construction and it is not yet completed. The thing that, um, of all that stuff in there, that first verse, when they say we are the servants of God of heaven and earth. In other translations, that's the NASB in in the the NIV, it says we are doing the work of God. They had met opposition. They had met people who tried to stop them. But execution requires perseverance and recognition of God's role, period. We have to understand, like I said, I've already said it repeatedly, we have to understand that this is God moving, that God wants to move, that God is in control, that we want to do what God wants us to do, not what I want to do, okay? Because honestly, if you're waiting, if you want me to be the one who is moving forward and making big pictures and and making big plans... I am not a natural, naturally entrepreneurial person. I'm not constantly trying to start new things and grow things and grow businesses. If we were going to do that, there are people in this room who God would have told to be in, in charge. If you want to play Lego Marvel superheroes, that's me because I'm good at that and my boys are very good at that. But we have to realize that God is the one moving us forward, and we have to be willing to do that. And I've, I've been excited to see over the last four or five months, as people come to me and say, you know what, God has laid on my heart, you know, as my, I've, been pray, I've been praying for this church, and I've been praying that God will show us where to go. People saying, I'm studying the Bible, and when, he, when, when I'm reading this, I'm seeing us where we are, and I'm seeing what God wants to do in our lives and in our church. That's The exciting thing, because when you see those things, that's God's hand all over it. It's not mine. It's not yours. This morning, when when Mark Curry came up, I'll tell you, I was struggling with this with this sermon, not with putting it together, but just with the presentation of it this morning. And when Mark Curry came up to me and said, "When I looked at the program this morning and realized that you were reading Ezra, I was it answered my question as to why God sent me to Ezra this week, and why I was reading Ezra." That's God's hand. It's not mine. We have to recognize God's plan, but we also have to realize that there's going to be opposition. Sometimes it's going to be from outside. Sometimes it's going to be from inside. Sometimes it's going to be from people in your families, people you know, friends that you know. It's it's going to be from all kinds of different things. But the importance is to understand that when that comes and when we have setbacks and when sometimes it seems like we're going more backward than forward, that we must continue the work that God has given us to do. Period. We have to continue to move that direction. It was, it was years and years before the temple was finished. And there was a time period where the people got kind of dejected and they kind of got down. And they looked and they were like, what? The people around us don't want us here. We're, we're struggling. We don't have what we need. The, the, it's, why, why don't we just give up? And the reality of the fact that it was God's plan, that it had been given, that, that David had, had been a part of the plan, that Solomon had, had fulfilled the, the actual building of the temple, the fact that their family members had, had sweated and, and bled and died and that they had been in captivity, and one of the things that was great in there is they also acknowledged their, the fault failings of their families. They, they acknowledged the sin of the past and realized 
that was a big part of why God wasn't moving. And I will encourage you, as I did earlier today, but I continue to encourage you, allow God to show you your life. Allow Him to, to look at you and to look at the condition of your heart. Because we struggle sometimes to wonder why the, why the church doesn't grow or why things don't happen, and we want to blame what all these reasons. And I will tell you, in, in, in personal life, in family life, and in church life, the dominant reason is not lack of vision. The dominant vi- reason is not even lack of workers, even though we like to talk about it. The dominant reason is sin. It's because we allow sin to in- invade our lives. We allow it to take over. We allow it to distract us from so many different things. And sometimes all it takes is repentance. And God will do amazing things. But we have to realize it's God's role. If we go to Ezra 6, and this is, this is the exciting part of it. Ezra 6, 13, well, all, it's all exciting. But Then Tatini, I said that wrong, but I don't care. The governor of the province beyond the river, Shethar Bozani, and their colleagues carried out the decree with all diligence, just as King Darius had sent. And the elders of the Jews were successful in building through the prophesying of Haggai, and the prophet Zechariah, the son of Edo, and they finished building according to the command of the God of Israel and the decree of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. This temple was completed on the third day of the month Adar. It was the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. And the sons of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the exiles celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. I would encourage you to go read those other two books to see kind of the response that the prophets had to some of the issues that the people were experiencing. Just as just to kind of a, as an additional amount of reading. But one of the things that I looked at there is uh, that I saw, because I feel like that maybe we've lost it sometimes to a certain extent, um, because we're worried that when we do this, it's, a, it's an act of pride, or because sometimes when we do it, it's an act of um, forgetting God, is this idea of celebration. When God does amazing things, we need to celebrate it. When He's working in your life, you need to tell somebody. That's why I said it earlier. When, our church, when things are happening in our church, we need to celebrate them. It doesn't, and not because we're trying to shove it in the faces of other churches, even though sometimes that has a tendency to happen. Not because of that, but because when God's doing amazing things, we must celebrate God. Not celebrating us and how awesome we are and how amazing we do we are and how holy we are, but because we serve a God who is willing to use very flawed people to fulfill his plan and that we get to be a part of it. We must celebrate those things in our lives and in our church. And, and I'll tell you, and I've said that a lot today, but I, I, this, the, the thing is, when you start celebrating those types of things, when you start getting excited about what's happening at your church, you are going to come up with opposition. There are people who are going to say, would you please stop talking about your church? I'm so sick of hearing about how awesome your church is. Yes, we know that people are getting saved at your church. Please stop. And then there will be, and, and my, on my end of it, pastors will say, that's great. How many are you running on Sunday? What was your offering last week? That's what I get as the pastor. But we have to understand that it's, we should celebrate small victories and large victories. There are people outside and inside of this church who thought that if Greg Scott left as pastor, this church would fold. That's right, we're still here. We will be here. There are people who thought it was going to happen. Some of you may be sitting here. It's not still here because of me. 
is here because there's a plan that God has for this church. And if you will continue to be part of it, He will continue to see things, to do great things through us. And we should celebrate the fact that six months later, God is still working, God is still moving, God is still doing things. It doesn't mean that we're going to put out a banner out, hey, Greg's gone, everything's awesome. It doesn't mean that in five years, if I'm gone and someone else is here, you know, it's, it's, and whatever it looks like there, that you're going to celebrate the fact that those things happen. But we should celebrate when God's doing amazing things, when God is doing stuff in our lives. And I encourage that. And so here at the church, it's our, it's our time to execute. I told you last week, we've got transforming lives and serving Jesus Christ as our vision statement, it's our mission statement. And I, I took that and said, basically what that means is we want to be disciples who make disciples. That's the goal. And we're, we've got plans for that. And we're doing Bible studies now. We're, we're starting some Bible studies with our, um, t- oh, with our youth group to make, help them be disciples who make disciples. Uh, we're starting those in February. We're going to do some membership stuff. We're going to be doing all these other types of things, and we have plans. But here's the deal. It's time to execute the plan. If I'm the only person doing it, it doesn't do any good. If there are 15 people or 18 people who are basically on our leadership, and they're the ones trying to execute all this, it will be frustrating, and it will fail. So it's time for us to execute. We want to be disciples who make disciples. And we've got three ministries here at the church. Okay, and we've talked about them a little bit, but I haven't really given you some, because there are some people who really want to know what the, all the different things are. And the first one we have is the celebration team. Celebration team is not just the people up here on Sunday morning. They provide worship and they do great, a great job. And, and uh, hopefully you guys realize that when I was talking about Steve earlier, it was a complete joke. And I'm not going to talk any more about him because I'll start crying. Um, so... They, these, they're these people, but they're also those people back there on Sunday morning. There are people in the back room praying right now. Our prayer team is part of that celebration team. The, the guys who take up the offering are part of the celebration team. The videos and media and all that kind of stuff are part of that celebration. When, when we do communion and we do baptisms, there are people who are there in place, but there are also other needs that we have for people to be part of of the celebration team. I just told you celebration was important. So let's, you know, if you're a part of that, if you've got the skills, if you've got the gifts, be part of that. There are so many different opportunities in that, such, in that situation, and it's time for us, if we are going to be a people of celebration, to celebrate and to put ourselves in those positions to, to do what needs to be done. There's also our community team. The community team deals with our church community, that's our small groups. Now, right now we've got about two and a half small groups running, and we've, we want more of those. But I also acknowledge that there are people in this room who do not like small groups. They don't want to go to someone's house and hang out and study the Bible, not because they don't like the Bible, but because it's just not their comfort zone. They would much rather come here on a, on a Wednesday or a Thursday or a Friday and do a Bible study or take a class on basic theology or church history or things like that, and those are things that we can do. We've tried for a very long time in various ways with various levels of success to try to do small groups in homes. We call them home huddles. And for years, um, some people have been very involved in them. I've had a home huddle in my house since before we were here at the church, before I even knew they were called home huddles. We had a small group at our church or our house. But some of you would be much more comfortable with one-on-one discipleship. Others of you would be much more comfortable in a, in a classroom setting or something like that. And so we've got those options for you. But also, I can't lead every group. I can't teach every class. And there are people in this room who are extremely gifted at doing those things. And there's, there's, there's a need. There's a time, it's time to execute and not sit back and wonder why we don't have X, Y, and Z. Uh, our support team for staff, our, our membership team, uh, the people looking at our members and taking care of members are part of that. Um, there are the people who are planning the special events and stepping, doing Bible study and even taking care of our property. This week I found out 
that we, at the end of January, um, Amy Harrison, who's done a great job over the last few years, I don't know how long she's been doing it, she was, she's been cleaning uh, the church um, since before she came to the church, that in January she's not going to be, after January she won't be doing it anymore. Um, it was one of three part-time jobs she had. It was taking too much time um, away from her family. She wanted to do it. I told her that was a great idea. I told her that's what I wanted her to do, if that's what she felt like doing. So she's not going to be doing it. Now we have two options. We can find someone else and we can pay them to come clean every week. But there's also the other option that we've tried before on various levels of success, that people over the church would decide that they would ex execute the plan of getting the root building clean once a week. That's the an, that's an thing. And, and I'm, not, I'm fine either way. But if you're someone who's concerned about the financial situation of the church and you want to find a way to help us not have as much out, you know, the, to pay out as much, organize people to come clean. Then it will be free. So just think about it. I'm not saying you have to do that, and, I'm say, and, and if we decide we found someone else to clean it, I'm cool with that too, as long as the job gets done. But I want you to think about those things. There are property issues. There's, when, some, when spring comes, there's mowing, and there are flowers to be what, done to whatever you do flowers to, and there's all kinds of stuff that has to happen. And it's there. It's part of it. And honestly... Taking care of the, of the flowers and the landscaping and the mowing, you think, well, that's, people might, might think, well, that's silly. You know, we're in the, middle of a, you know, in the middle of a field. Let's just let it grow up and, you know, be the ninja church. No one can see. <laughs> okay? But part of taking care of, of the plan, of executing the plan of what God has given us, is to have a place that when people come here, they don't have to use a machete to get to the front door for service on Sunday morning. And so if you are really good at mowing or at all those things or you have a green thumb, as you can tell probably from what I'm saying, I don't, you have an important role you can play here in our community team. And you think, well, how's that, how's that making disciples? The group of people who decide that they're going to take care of the property, take care of the building, to, to mow the property, they can be, that could be your, the, that could be the place, that could be the group of people that challenges you to become something new, something different. That's, that could be, you could meet somebody in that area who doesn't know Jesus as well as you know Jesus, and you can help bring them together. You don't have to have a class. You don't have to have a house to do a small group. You create community with people, where people come together, the common cause, a common reason, and they support one another, and they push each other to better and better things. The Bible calls it, you know, iron sharpening iron. And so we also have the final team is the care team. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit extra time on this because there are people who have come in and you don't necessarily know. Um, you've probably seen the, the kid or whoever standing at the door with the big um, jar and you wonder what that is and you and, 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 uh, just kind of have a question about it. You don't want to ask Amy because she's kind of scary. And so you, you, um, you don't know what that is. And what we do is we actually support Southwestern Elementary School and the, county, the Gallia County Snack Pack Program. What that means is there are, what, 76 kids? 70 kids this year who um, are, for whatever reason, are on, on this, t on this uh, list of kids who struggle, or whose families struggle, with food, with feeding them. And I, I don't, honestly, I, this is not a political statement. This is not a, well, their parents probably get money, stuff. I, I, honestly, that's an argument for someplace else. Here's the reality. Um, I've, I have an issue with, um, with not knowing where our money goes, and so I asked. Because there's a lot of effort that's put into snack packs. There's a lot of effort. And, there, and people in this church have been wonderful, even... When other things were kind of struggling, the snack pack program continued to do pretty well. But I started asking some people in the care team this week, well, how do we know that this is actually getting to the kids who need it? 
And I was, I was told two stories, only two stories, that, that changed my entire perspective of snack packs. One of them came from a guy who's no longer with us named Gene Call. And Gene Call, was, uh, he worked for the, the rural water department. And he said that one day he was at a house. And this little boy came to the door and he had a jar of peanut butter. And he was talking, Gene was talking to him and he said, this is my jar of peanut butter. No one else in my family can have it. It's not my brother's jar. It's not my sister's jar. It's my jar of peanut butter. And he was thrilled because he had it. And the purpose of Snack Pack program, if you don't know, is to give food to kids because they, the nurses in the schools had kids who were coming to school on Monday and the last meal that they had eaten was lunch on Friday. Now you can lament the poor parenting skills, you can do all those types of things, but, the, but the, the thing was not to put food or money into the hands of the parents who might use it for other things, it's to put the food into the hands of the kids. And some of the kids, I've heard stories of them devouring it on the bus. The bus drivers were telling them they couldn't, they, they need to keep it, you know, see, hide it and not use it because it was, um, they would eat it all before they got home or they would do all kinds of other things. I heard another story about a little, well, it's actually, it was, from, it was Jim Blevins um, delivered the, the, uh, to a school, to Southwestern one day. The little boy was, opening the, was holding the door open for him. And he was so excited because Jim was bringing the snack packs because he got one of them. And that meant that it was, it was his, you know, he, that was the time of the month and he, he could get that and he could take it home and he, could, he, could, um, he would have some food. He'd be, have some extra food. That's a simple thing. And honestly, if you look at our snack pack program out there, it's, a, it's very simple, 70 kids, the list of what we do is, is not much, um, but if it makes an impact, and, and I, I've, I've asked that question, how does that help us make disciples? We don't even get to know the kids. We don't even get to meet them. We don't even know who they are. How does that make us people who are making disciples? And honestly, I don't know, but I do know that we were called take care of the orphans and the widows and those who needed help. So they're going to be out there again today. Was I, did I talk about it enough this time? Okay, thanks. They're going to be out there today. They're going to have their, their jar. If you have any other questions, they will ask you. You can ask them. They will be more than happy to tell you about it. But that is part of what we do. And the care team is also evangelism. It's missions work. Um, so you guys saw Sean and Bethany Wall, our, our friends who are missionaries of Papua New Guinea. They made it to Papua New Guinea at the beginning of the year this year. They're over there working. Um, they're disciples who are making disciples in another language. They're, teach, they're doing amazing things over there, actually training pastors to go into their churches. That's where our money goes. That's what we're doing to execute the plan God has given to us. Meals that heal is another thing that we do, um, and in any other outreach. And, but the goal is that we, through our care team, we will reach out to our community so that but we can be disciples who make disciples. I've got a, a few more things, and we're done. In First Corinthians twelve, Paul's actually talking, and it's interesting because next month we're talking about First Corinthians thirteen all month. Uh, the love chapter. Everybody loves the love chapter. Um, but for right now, we're talking about chapter 12, the gifts chapter. I don't, I don't know. It doesn't really have a cool name. Um, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries in the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things and all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge, and according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, and another gifts of healing by one Spirit. And to another, the effecting of miracles, and to another, prophecy, and to another, distinguishing of spirits, to another, various kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually 
just as he wills. And so, I talked about it a little bit last week, but if you are someone who's placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you have been given gifts by the Holy Spirit. They're all, there are a variety of gifts. You all have different ones. But they're all important, and we're going to read it in just a second. But you all have, y'all, I've never used that phrase before. My, you all have gifts, and you all need to find them and use them. It's very important. Now, I've got something I, I, it's set up. It's, it's over here. Um, I was, uh, initially, I was going to just give it to everybody in the church, but then I realized that didn't work all so well with the questionnaire, so I'm not doing that again. Um, but here's what I want to encourage you to do. We have a spiritual gifts inventory that we have that um, we have done with, I did it with my leadership team already in the fall, um, and I, want, I would encourage, I want everybody who really has decided that it's time for them to step up and, and to, to work and to, to be a part of, of the, um, the work of Fellowship of Faith to take one of these inventories. It's not a hard thing. You rank things one to five, they're in you know, 10 or 12 different categories, it's very simple, and then all you do is put your name on it list your top three or four, and just leave it back there. That's it. And then I will we'll get in touch with you. If you've already done a spiritual gifts inventory, or like me, have done 700 of them, okay, take a yellow card, put your name on it, flip it over, put spiritual gifts, and then write your top two or three on there. You don't have to take the inventory again, because it's probably just going to tell you the same thing. Okay, but I encourage you to do that. And, um, the reason I, want, I encourage you to do that is because it helps us know where you will fit best. It will also help you know where you fit best. There, um, one of the biggest struggles for people is when they're doing something that they just don't fit well. Just doesn't. Now, one of the great things about Fellowship of Faith that some of you probably don't know, and especially some of you who have been doing things for a very long time, with the exception of our leadership positions, when you say that you want to work in a ministry your commitment is only for a year. And some of you don't realize that, and you started eight years ago, and you don't realize that you could have stopped by now. Leadership is three years. This year we've got a few people who are on year four because of the transition, but it's three years. But when you do that, when you have people who are coming in and out every year and, coming and, and cycling in every three years, you need other people who will step up, who know the ministry, and who can come in and do what needs to be done. And the only way you can do that is if you have people who are gifted, not only in the service and in doing what, but also in the leadership and on all of those types of things. And so it's important. And I want to I encourage you. I'm going to take these back. They're going to be at the Connection Center. Um, and you can just take one of the spiritual gifts inventories. I've got some other things that we're going to, we're going to start putting out on the, on the uh, walls of the of the lobby so you can pull those out and you can and read those but it's all there it will I'll, I'll give those to you and it's very very simple very very straightforward forward but it's important we all have gifts we all need to find them and use them and the 12 uh, the 21st verse of 1 Corinthians 12 it says the eye cannot say to the hand I have no need of you or again the head to the feet I have no need of you or the contrary it's much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary and those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. And our less presentable members become much more presentable. Whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked. So that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffers with it. Suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you're a Christ's body and individually members of it. I wanted to, to talk about this part of it because a lot of times when we talk about spiritual gifts, it, it kind of gets lost. But I, I thought it was amazing because what, what Paul was saying really lines up with what Jesus said as far as service and who is honored and who is important in the service of the kingdom. Um, I don't know who Paul was talking about as the more presentable and the less presentable. I had to stifle my, you know, I, I ha always have jokes that I want to throw out, but I realize a lot of people don't get them or think they're funny, so I had to stop that one. But I don't know who that is. But I think a lot of times when people look at the pastor who was speaking on Sunday morning, 
or they look at the person leading worship, or they look at the, the, uh, the people playing in the band, or even you know, connection center people and all those types of things, they look at those as the presentable ones. They're the ones who have the big gifts, and they're the ones who are important. And, and what Paul is saying is the small things, the small things are the important things. I said earlier when we were talking about giving and I talked about your, your smallest gift can be used, it's, it, it is the same with the gifts that you have, the smallest act of service. I appreciate it when people come in and do small things. I'll give you an example. Um, this is, and this is, again, some of you are going to say this doesn't make sense, but for me it's a big deal. Uh, we have like six HVAC units in this, on this building. The filters must be changed every month. Now, if you guys are like me at your house, that means every three months. But here at the church, because they run the way they do and because we don't want them to, to collapse, and actually some of the ones have three filters. They've got a regular tiny filter and two big ones. Every month those have to be changed. Now, when I was full-time before, I changed them because they had to hap- it had to happen, and we struggled, as we still struggle, with people who will be willing to be part of the property team to do it. But if last year sometime, well, I went about the time I went part-time, I was talking to somebody, and they said, you know what, I will, I'll just do that. I'll just check the filters for you. And I, you don't understand how, how exciting that was for me, that I didn't have to try to figure out how to come out and do that. And it takes 10 minutes. Literally, you go through, you check them. If they're fine, you just don't do anything to them. Last week, when the weather was really bad, I was out there and I went and checked them because I thought, I don't know if this is still being done. I don't know who's doing it. And I went out and I checked, and, and they, were, they were clean, relatively clean. And it was good to feel that. And it's a small thing. But for me now, what I think of is if one of those goes down, what kind of expense does that put on the church? What ministry doesn't get done because someone didn't change a filter? Because we have to change, we have to move money to another place. That's a small, small job. One of the other jobs that you guys don't realize and, 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 and that people have when they, being part of the church is showing up on Sunday morning. It's a small thing. You think, it's not a big deal. They don't recognize, notice when we're gone. Well, I, don't, they, I might not call you when you're gone. Someone may not say, oh, it was so sad that you weren't here, but being here on Sunday morning is a huge part of your service to this church. How many, some of you have invited people to your church, to a church. I've heard stories of people inviting people to the church and then not showing up. What, I mean, you, this is the most awesome church. You need to come. Please show up at our church on Sunday. And then they come and they're like, hey, where'd you go? I thought this was an awesome church you never wanted to miss. Show up. Be a part of it. So my question is, where do, where do we go from here? It's time for execution, right? We've got the plan. We've talked about the plan. We've talked about assessment. What do we do? Where do you go from here? If you don't know Jesus, your next step is pretty clear. You need to meet Jesus. If you've met Jesus, you're part of Fellowship of Faith, you've made the decision that you are going to not only follow Jesus, but this is your church. It's time for you to step up and be part of the execution of the plan God has given to be a disciple who makes a disciple. Whether that means filling out a spiritual gifts inventory and helping us figure out where where we can help uh, place you, whether it means stepping up this morning and saying, I don't know where you need me, but put me somewhere. Whatever it is, it's time. Or whether it's just you start inviting people or you start sharing your testimony and sharing your story about what's going on in your life to the rest of the world, where do we go from here? Because January is almost done. We're going to start doing some other things in February with the goal. I believe it's the plan that God gave us to be disciples who made disciples. And we're going to be moving forward. We're not going to sit on this plan and, sit on, and, and look back in five years and go, you know, that was a really great plan. I wish we'd have done something with it. We're moving we need you to be part of it. 
Would you uh, stand up and pray with me, please? God, I thank you for um, everything. I thank you for just the way you continue to show up, the way you continue to speak. I pray that as we go through the rest of the the service, as we go through the rest of the week, um, that you will speak through words I've said, through these scriptures, whatever it is, Lord, that you will speak and that you will help us all to realize our part in this plan and that we will cooperate, that we will acknowledge you, that we will stand up in in spite of, of resistance that we will continue to, to pers- persevere, and that we will continue to, to and we will celebrate those, uh, those successes. God, we love you so much. We know that you're doing amazing things. We pray that you just continue to move and continue to speak and continue to guide us. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Uh, before they play, I want to remind everybody one more thing. Um, our general worship service, our normal service that, at two o'clock tonight, today, uh, for our um, that's designed for our, our uh, parts of our community who have uh, autistic. Um, well, they're, they're part of the autism spectrum. Um, is at two o'clock today. Uh, anybody's invited to that, but also I want to encourage you to, to come back, go eat lunch, come back, and be part of that with us, because the goal is not that we create a separate, you know. Um, service for them where they're, you know, completely separated, but that they are part of our community. And uh, the way that they become part of our community is if we support them as, our, as the community. So I just wanted to remind you of that.